Hello, kings and queens. It's Wisdom Starter and good evening. So tonight we're going to be talking about Emmett Till. This story may not be um, unfamiliar to many of you, but I found some documentaries that had some really interesting information about this story that I myself did not know. So let me first welcome all of you kings and queens, and thank you so much for being on the live. Um, Tamara says, hope everyone enjoyed the watch party. So listen, we had um, <laughs> we had some technical difficulties with the watch party. However, we were able to finally pivot over to um, Zoom, and we were able to make it work with just a handful of people who were able to make it onto the Zoom. But I'm um, going to be honest with you, we will reschedule the uh, the watch party because um you know just being on zoom it's not the same it's it's not the same as if you were on a platform where even though we were chatting it just it's just not the same experience so um anyway so no worries for those of you who did not catch uh the watch party we will be redoing the watch party there's another platform that i was informed about that is not as restricted with youtube but does connect to youtube and so we'll we'll definitely get into that but we're going to be getting into uh the emmett till um story as i said um there was so much information that came out of this documentary some of it is kind of recent in regards to this story. And so I've shared with many of you that I'm going to be doing uh, various stories like this for uh, Black Heritage Month or what many of us call Black History Month, okay? It is history, it is American history. And this is the story that I'm going to be covering on tonight. And so go ahead and put your popcorn emojis in the chat and let me just see who's here with us. So I've got uh, Tamara Palmer, she was the first queen in the building. Thank you so much. I've got Kim Victor. I have Kind Smile Carter, and I've got November Rain. And then I've got some a few more people in the bushes. No worries. I do have um, subscriber chat on. And so if you do want to partake in the conversation, you will need to hit the subscribe button. There is no fee for you to subscribe to the channel. I've got DJ. DJ's got his popcorn. DJ is ready to go or her popcorn i'm so sorry dj um dj's got her popcorn she's ready to go all right so let me go ahead and take down this banner and then we're going to head right into it so before we get into the documentary we're going to be looking at some of the uh photos from the incident and so i will warn you that um some of the photos are graphic and could be a little triggering. Some of these photos we've seen before, but I just kind of want to give you a heads up. November Rain says so she's at work tonight. <laughs> All right, Queen. Um, and so we'll we'll jump right into this first uh, very short uh, documentary because there were pictures that I had never seen before that I want to share uh, with you guys. So let's go ahead and do that first. This is titled "The Body of Emmett Till." And this was done by Time Magazine, all right? Done by Time Magazine, so. All right. I believe that the whole United States is mourning with me. And if the death of my son can mean something to the other unfortunate people all over the world, then for him to have died a hero would mean more to me than for him just to have died. Emmett Till, 14, was kidnapped and killed allegedly for wolf whistling at the wife of accused Roy Bryant. It's not just that they discover his body and that he's been killed. He has been brutally, brutally beaten. As a criminal defense attorney, when we look at crimes, we often try to put together a picture about what happened. And it takes a lot of hatred and a lot of rage to do the kind of violence that was done to Emmett Till being a black boy in the American South could be quite perilous. The allegation that Emmett Till was being social 
with a white woman was considered an affront, a threat to the racial order. And I think the shock of his death was compounded by the brutality of his death. Emmett's mother couldn't actually conform to the conventions of the time, and she did something really quite remarkable. She made the really unorthodox choice of having a funeral with an open casket that was going to be very widely publicized, that was going to be attended by the national press. She wanted civil rights leaders and political leaders to see what they did to her child. She invited David Jackson and Jet Magazine to take pictures of this child's battered body. And these images were widely circulated. Jet Magazine was a publication that was primarily produced and distributed to the African-American community that had been trying to educate the rest of the country about the horrors of segregation and racial violence and lynching in the American South. And the images were really, really challenging. It was the kind of visual uh, that you didn't typically see. You certainly didn't see it outside of a war zone and you certainly didn't see it with children. His face was grotesque. You could see eyes, but you couldn't really distinguish all of his facial features. That's how much violence he had been subjected to. And its mother's presence in the photo is really important because she's really giving witness to victimization and violence. The other images that Emmett's mother provided just created this notion of a very respectable young boy who was trying to make the very best impression on everyone he met. The juxtaposition of a little boy in a suit and a tie with his battered face was a stark image that made it really impossible for anyone who saw it to be silent about it. Mainstream publications like Look and Life began talking about this issue. It became an issue that elected officials were being questioned about. These images made it impossible for white families in other parts of the country to stay indifferent, to stay neutral. Never has this quiet little cotton growing community of Mississippi seen so much publicity and so much excitement as in the past few days. Nearly 200 of the town's five or 600 residents have packed into the courthouse to hear the day's proceedings. Do you have any evidence bearing on this case? I do know that this is my son. How long do you expect to be here? Until the trial is over. Bryant and his half-brother, J.W. Milam, were acquitted by this jury. And subsequently, even though they admitted taking the boy from the house, they were freed of kidnap charges. The inability to hold anyone accountable for his murder and the comfort with which the men who killed him were able to talk about the violence was just adding to the injury They weren't just killing a boy. They're expressing something rooted in this decades of animosity and fear and anger. A boy, a 14 year old boy was killed brutally. And one of our objectives here is to see to it that that boy whose picture you see there does not die an inconspicuous death and that his case will be remembered and something will be done about it. These images became powerful forces in organizing a new level of commitment and resistance. The brutal murder of Emmett Till really pushed Rosa Parks to a deeper level of activism. That was one of the motivating forces behind her choice to not give up her seat on that bus. And in many ways, it was an organizing and galvanizing moment for the civil rights movement in this country. 
these shootings of unarmed black boys and men have been going on for decades. It is a manifestation of this same presumption of dangerousness that killed Emmett Till, that killed thousands of people of color during the lynching era. Imagery and photography is a really important tool. Without the imagery, there would be no one who's prepared to believe some of the violence that we've witnessed. It's such a gratifying feeling to see you all sitting by and standing by, because I realized shortly after this thing happened that it wasn't a fight that I could do, that it was going to be a fight that we had to do, that the people would do for me, more or less. And... We've never made progress in this country around important social justice issues until we've given marginal victims a face. That image still has resonance, it still has power, and I think it still expresses the pain and anguish of a huge part of our population that is still hoping for basic recognition of their humanity. And I want you all to stand by me because it's going to be a fight. And if you will stand by me, I will stand by you because I am not afraid. Wow. Wow. She is um, very brave. Very, very, very brave. I'm going to show you something um, that I found. And so there are many people who have said that the Emmett Till story almost mirrors the Trayvon Martin story, you know, about a young boy who was where he had a right to be. And, you know, in one case, um, there was this, you know, idea that of, of we know, of, of white supremacy. But, you know, aside from that, in, in the South, you know, there was this idea of these, um, you know, Sididi Negroes and, you know, these Black folk that go up North and get real educated in Sididi and they come down, down South and they didn't like to see Black people well-dressed, Black people who spoke well. Um, black people who had any semblance of having any type of wealth. And there was a lot of jealousy there. You had a lot of poor, uneducated whites living in the South who couldn't even count. Some who ran businesses but couldn't even count, couldn't read, could barely write. Um, and so here walks in Emmett Till. You know, I don't know if any of you have actually seen the the, the movie, the latest one that they did. Um, it's actually really good. It was on Netflix. I'm not really sure where it is now. I'll find out and I'll, I'll um, put it in the chat. But, you know, I kept thinking to myself, his mom really didn't want to send him down to money. She had reservations about it. And against her own better judgment, she, she sent him anyway. She tried her best to educate him. Things are very different down there. And um, so I know as a mom, she probably felt a lot of guilt um, with not, going with her instinct in her first mind. And here you have a woman who unfortunately, um, Carol, uh, is it Carol? I'm just going to say Carol Burnett. That's not her name. Anyway. Um, but the, the white woman, white woman in the store who goes home to tell her husband, you know, what happened in the store. And to this day, we don't know exactly what happened in the store. It could be that Emmett Till looked her in the eye instead of looking at the floor. It could be that he said something, you know, that she deemed smart or sarcastic. Who knows? But nothing he could have done warranted the response and the violence that was enacted upon him. And then we have a Trayvon Martin um, who is again, walking where he should have been. And you have someone who unfortunately, um, you know, was kind of like took, a, took the vigilante type of role and wanted to play cop. But anyway, we're good. We're going to get into the um, meat and potatoes of the documentary that I really wanted you to see. I just wanted to show you those pictures because um, I had never seen those particular pictures. I had seen some and there's been a lot of documentaries, but to actually see it 
and see the condition that his body was actually in makes it very real. So we're going to jump right on into our next uh, documentary. And this one is titled, let me just share my screen again. This one is titled The Lost Story of Emmett Till. And this particular documentary is interesting because it really talks through the journey that this case has taken over the last almost 70 years with this family trying to get justice. And so very good documentary. Um, I may stop once or twice during the documentary uh, because this is content coming from NBC. I don't want you to flag it and take it down. And so we may, we may make one or two stops to talk, all right? Okay. And again, thank you guys for being on. Don't forget to like the video if you haven't already done so. And of course, I appreciate you guys. Emmett was considered a leader among his friends. He was not supposed to be. He whistled and scared us. He scared us so bad. This was the location where he heard the screams. I get hit at bar. And honestly, no one knows exactly where the body went into the water. Roy Bryan admitted that he had taken Emmett from his home. This is the original warrant. To have this space be brought back as close to the way it looked in 55 as possible. Well, he knew by testifying he could be killed for this. He handpicked the jury. We heard them announce the verdict, not guilty. How long ago, God, will we have a double standard of justice? And they began to piece together some federal violation. There was a recommendation that she be indicted, a recommendation by the FBI. The day is a day that we'll never forget. I know that his life can't be returned, but I hope that his death will certainly start a movement in these United States. Emmett Till's death did start a movement. The lost story of Emmett Till, then and now. shameful elements of this nation's past stain a bitter stain on America. There's no sign to show you you're in Money, Mississippi. It's in LaFleur County. In 1955, it was a town of around 400. Fewer than that live here now. You could easily drive right by what is now the relic of Bryant's grocery and meat market. Great Uncle Moe's Wright's home, the site of Till's kidnapping, is gone. Another home sits there now. The church where Moe's Wright preached is but walls held together by brush. But the story of the hate that was sown here in this fertile soil of the Mississippi Delta continues to be harvested. A legacy to all who have died under the oppression of slavery and Jim Crow and beyond, a legacy personified in the lynching of Emmett Till. Emmett was not just mine, he was a universal child. People were really able to see what had happened to a youngster simply because of hate and uh, race discrimination. I always felt bad because I, I came back. Surviving, right? Like I felt 
guilty uh, about that. When things bad happen to you, your heart is broken. It's just, it's shattered. When you have a broken heart, the heart heals, but it leaves scar tissue. In August 1955, 14-year-old Emmett Till joined his best friend and cousin Wheeler Parker and his great uncle Mose Wright on a train from Chicago to visit family in Money, Mississippi. Eight days into his visit, he was kidnapped by J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant. Emmett had whistled at Roy Bryant's wife Carolyn at the store they ran in Money four days before. I mean, we could have died. I mean, it just, we couldn't believe that. In 1955, a black boy whistling at a white woman in Mississippi was a grave error, immediately recognized by his cousins who were there at the time. We scared us half to death. And we couldn't get out of town fast enough. We all just made a beeline. Nobody said, let's go and then we just made a beeline for the car. It was time to go because this is a death sentence. When they got home, they told no. Three days passed and they forgot about it. Of course, we was uh, apprehensive maybe the first day, but after, you know, Thursday passed and Friday passed and nothing happened, we forgot all about it. I didn't think any more about it. That is, until early Sunday morning. I heard about 2.30, I heard them talking. And I heard the noise, you know, the loud talking. I heard them talking, so you got two boys from Chicago. And one talked to the fat one, they did the talk at the store. I woke up and saw these two white men standing at the foot of my bed. And I think Emmett got up and they told him to put his shoes. I think he wanted to put his socks on. Anyway, it was it was pure hell. I mean, it, you hear how they refer to Emmett Till, the fat one? <sighs> Absolutely disgusting. It was just, it was horrible. Our world was turned upside down. It was never the same again. After kidnapping Emmett Till, it's believed J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant brought him here to this barn in Drew, Mississippi. Drew is about 30 miles from money in Sunflower County. That day, an 18-year-old named Willie Reed saw Emmett. The only place I'm ever saw him was Willie on the back of that truck. In 2004, the FBI brought Willie Reed back to this barn. You know, this is there when the FBI showed up. This is this dentist Jeff brought. Andrews bought the barn in 1992 and he still owns it today. The FBI brought him here and um, he said this was the location where he saw where he heard the screams he didn't see. I saw him motion and, and say, I was walking down this road right here, and he pointed at the driveway. Look, when I get near that barn and hit that beating that barn out there, I know it. You know, if he heard that and he was this close, I'm sure he probably didn't stick around too long. So, uh, you know, because that's, you see how close proximity that is. But, you know, this was the area here and, and that, that, uh, So this is the Black Bayou Bridge on the south side of Glendora. So the belief is that the murderers left the barn in Drew with Till wrapped in a tarp, either beaten within an inch of his life or perhaps even dead. But then they brought him back to Glendora where they obtained the cotton gin fan and then brought him to this bridge and dropped him in the river through the gap in these V-shaped girders right here. The body of 14-year-old Emmett Till weighed down by a gin fan, was tossed into the water. It's not clear exactly where Emmett Till's body was thrown or exactly where it was found. But three days after his kidnapping, Emmett Till's body was found. It shouldn't have been found. Because they had waited, they had it properly done to wait it down. But going downstream, it snagged. Imagine being 17 years old and fishing on a beautiful day like you might do any other time in your life. 
and noticing two knees bobbing out of the Tallahatchie River. That's exactly what happened when Emmett Till's body was discovered. Once Emmett's body was pulled out of the river, Mamie Till made three key decisions that cemented her son's legacy as a catalyst for the civil rights movement. First, she ordered his body back to Chicago. I remember being there when we wait, stayed up all night waiting on a body to come in from uh, Mississippi. And when it did come in, she demanded that the body be open so they, the world could see what they did to my boy. Mamie secondly ordered her son Emmett's casket remain open. Tens of thousands would file past it at Robert's temple and see. And when they opened the casket in the funeral home, uh, I remember a piece of his skull fell off and my photographer went over and reached over and picked it up and put it back on before he shot a picture. And that picture, Mamie allowing that picture to be taken and then published by Jet Magazine was her third pivotal decision. A very crucial scene, but she was a tough lady. It was courageous. It was very courageous. The picture's worth a thousand words. I mean, the world needed this shock. They, they needed it. I think it really let us see the ugly monster that uh, race hatred is. It's almost as if it was embodied in, in uh, his appearance, in his physical appearance, because it is a monster. She changes everything in that moment. She wants the world to see what they've done to my son. So we're going to go back to the basement here. And this is the area where they found the warrant at. In early 2022, a filmmaker found the kidnapping warrant for the arrest of J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant in these files at the LaFleur County Courthouse. Also named on the warrant, Roy Bryant's wife, Carolyn, though she was never arrested. When the FBI investigated in 2004, they asked court officials and law enforcement to look for any documents with information related to the case. The warrant never came up. The current LaFleur County clerk, Elma Stockstill, has long time experience in the clerk's office and with its files. He had an idea where to look. He could also verify its authenticity. From my experience as a second clerk, and I knew these was original, original papers, and you see how old and brittle they are? So I knew from the fact that they was orig original paper. Then I looked at the uh, calls number up here, all these case numbers and everything. All this lined up with previous cases that I've seen from that particular time frame. So I knew that that was authentic. authentic so. After Emmett was kidnapped, Mose Wright searched for Emmett himself. He also went to see LaFleur County Sheriff George Smith, who then went to see Roy Bryant. Roy Bryant admitted that he had taken Emmett from his home and let him loose. Taking him from his home was enough to uh, establish kidnapping, and he was arrested. That was around 2 o'clock on Sunday, August 28th, according to the 2004 FBI report. The next day, according to that same report, J.W. Milam came by the LaFleur County Jail and also admitted to taking Till. It's not used as a jail today, but it was in 1955, and it's where Milam and Bryant waited until their trial in Tallahatchie County. They were here when Emmett Till's body was found, and they were then charged with Emmett Till's murder. The trial was held here in Sumner in Tallahatchie County, body was found here. The Tallahatchie County Courthouse is still a working courthouse, 
The room where the trial of J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant was held is still a working courtroom. It was remodeled in the early 1970s, and then in 2015, was intentionally restored to the way it would have looked back in 1955. So, so this is important for a number of reasons. I'm not forgetting what happened here, what happened in our town and our community when we think very specifically about this trial in this case. Benjamin Salisbury now gives tours of the courtroom and hosts talks about the trial and navigating the past it represents and how to move forward. Publicly and collectively talking about race and racism and, and publicly and collectively um, being mindful of, of how it has impacted us. Mississippi in 1955 was reeling, as was much of the South. It was a police state. It was like apartheid. No question about that. The Supreme Court Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954 begat white citizens councils bent on preserving segregated life in the South. By November, the councils had 65,000 members in Mississippi and would eventually grow to 208,000 members throughout the South. The citizens councils are all around the state. They're different than the Klan in that they are more middle class and upper class. They're very powerful. That's where the action is as far as white opposition. to Integration. They were generally referred to as the Q Coach Klan in coach and ties. This is Dr. Stephen Whitaker, a Tallahatchie County native. He wrote the first extensive review of the Emmett Till case for his master's thesis in 1963. In it, he points out the primary concern segregationists had with integration was that black men would become romantically involved with white women. In his opening chapter, Sex and Segregation, Whitaker cites Gunnar Myrdal's An American Dilemma. Sex becomes the principle around which the whole structure of segregation of the Negro is organized. The Southern man on the street responds to any plea for social equality with, would you like to have your daughter marry a Negro? Ever since Reconstruction, that, that's been pumped and pumped and um, used to generate fear. The other great fear that they had was that if black people were able to vote, that they would take over and run the counties and run the state. They saw the desegregation of public schools as a real threat to this way of life, which is the racist euphemism for apartheid, basically. And they saw it as extending from schools to uh, jobs, to stores, to neighborhoods, to voting. When Emmett Till ventured to Mississippi, only 4% of eligible black voters were registered and not a single black person was registered to vote in Tallahatchie County, despite 56% of the county being blacks of voting age. So the tension stirred by the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision by the Supreme Court only began to boil by 1955, when the Supreme Court issued its implementation decision, or Brown versus Board of Education II, which ordered integration with all deliberate speed. Also in 1955, Two African Americans were lynched for trying to register black people to vote, George Lee and Lamar Smith. Smith was shot to death on the courthouse. And don't forget to hit the like button if you have not already done so. And welcome, Shay B. Thank you so much for being with us, Queen. You know, I'm doing this because there are the grounds schools. of Brookhaven seven days before Emmett boarded his train in Chicago, bound for Mississippi. White folks in the South. Schools are not really teaching um, black history too much anymore. I think there's this general idea of we just want to forget. We don't want to um, acknowledge those things because they're they're painful and, and we get that. So, um, again, some of this stuff, you know, you, you guys can, can watch and determine what you would like to share with your children. But for certain, I have a 13, 14 year old, and I'm going to make sure that I take the time and share this with him because these children 
they don't know. And if they don't know where they came from, they could easily end up back into some of those situations, you know, um, um, what's the word that I'm looking for with, uh, with the schools and with a lot of other things, a lot of the rights that we had are being taken away. Affirmative action, for example, is being taken away. Um, DJ says, I'm from Valdosta. Ken the Johnson's mom chose to have his photo published too. Wow. Hi, Alexia Elder. Hello. Uh, Shaby said, I love my heritage history. I was rolling on two wheels <laughs> to get home. And um, what we did in the beginning, Shay, so once you finish, you know, you can, or if you choose to do it now, you can, you, you can roll it back. But we started out with a document, a, a short, less than 10 minute documentary by Time Magazine titled 100 Photos of Emmett Till. And if you've ever wanted to see what Emmett Till really looked like, because when you Google Emmett Till, the pictures are very grainy, but if you really want to see what this boy looked like, you know, and I say boy, but he was, you know, he was a teenager. He was about, you know, around my son's age you'll see it in the beginning. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and let this play and we'll continue talking in the chat. And again, don't forget to hit the like button for me. South were up in arms. Massive resistance is what they called it. A reign of terror is what black folks called it. And this is the environment that Emmett was walking into. It began September 19th, 1955. Every defense attorney in town volunteered to represent Milam and Bryant. According to press reports, a defense fund raised $10,000, and an all-white jury was seated. For his 1963 thesis, Whitaker interviewed them all. Everyone treated me well. Everyone was very open about it. All the lawyers, both sides, the judge, all the jurors, all gave me interviews. And what Whitaker learned about the jury pool is eye-opening. The man in charge of picking the list of jurors was the county attorney. The county attorney at the time was John Whitten, one of Milam and Bryant's defense attorneys. He handpicked the jury. He assured that the list uh, from which the jury was taken had only people that he was pretty certain were totally racist and who would think nothing of killing an African-American. The Tallahatchie County District Attorney was Gerald Chatham. He requested help from the state to take on this case. Attorney and former FBI agent Robert Smith III was appointed as special prosecutor. I'm very proud of my, that my father took that stand. Nobody had ever really prosecuted a white person in Mississippi for killing a black person. And Smith and Chatham had many challenges. The hand-picked jury pool they may not have known about. But they would have known they were not getting help from their own investigator, Tallahatchie Sheriff H.C. Strider. Strider was a staunch segregationist. We never have any trouble until some of our southern niggas go up north and the NAACP talks to them and they come back home. Sheriff Strider was also running things in the courtroom, and he demanded segregation even among the press. The sheriff, H.C. Strider, declared at the beginning of the trial that there would be no mixing, no race mixing, as he called it. So the white journalists were not supposed to interact with the black journalists. But what Strider didn't know was that not only were white journalists interacting with black journalists, they were all working together to further the investigation of the case, along with the NAACP and the sheriff of LaFleur County, George Smith. It all began with a tip to Dr. T.R.M. Howard. This guy named Frank Young, he had information that people had witnessed, African-Americans had witnessed, Till being brought into equipment shed in a farm. Dr. Howard was a well-established doctor and civil rights activist based in the all-black town of Mount Bayou, Mississippi. And this is the day before the trial. So the trial was scheduled to occur on Monday. This occurred on Sunday. He gets uh, NAAC people together like Medgar Evers, Amzie Moore, ultimately goes to black reporters and he says, look, we have evidence here that this had occurred. We got to go find these witnesses. Simeon Booker and Moses Newsom were among those reporters. Our driver was Medgar Evers, um, who drove us to all those back, 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 
yard plantations and plains where we were trying to find witnesses back there. We changed clothes and went out wearing something, something like plantation workers would uh, used to be wearing. We did round up a couple of people who uh, did actually testify in the case. And that's how people like Willie Reed were discovered and, and brought into trial. Well, become a field while Willie Reed was just 18 years old. Then nobody swayed me to do But I mean, I just didn't think because I had to tell the truth because I, that wasn't true. Willie Reed, Mamie Till, and some members of the black press also stayed at Dr. T.R.M. Howard's compound in Mount Bayou. So his house was here, or it was over there? No, see where that house Oh, was. where that house That's is. where his house was. It burned down, mysteriously, yeah. I guess, right? You could see... A thousand acres. Yeah. So I don't know if it was all, all continuous. back in there. Yeah. Nothing is left of T.R.M. Howard's Mount Bayou home today. But in 1955, it was quite the place. And for those associated with the trial, it was secure. It was highly secure because Mount Bayou is an all-black town. Howard had a 24-hour security that he'd had for quite some time. He was heavily armed. I didn't know anything at all about Mount Bayou. I didn't know it was an all-black town. I didn't know that the people in Mount Bayou did not tolerate any uh, invasion of any kind. Now, the Iowa house just like uh, trying to get into the White House because he had... It's God that they could go through it. Willie Reed was a surprise witness at the trial. His testimony, a key link in the case. It won't establish the time and place of the actual murder, but it will connect the defendants the with the crime. He testified to seeing Emmett in the back of a 55 Chevy truck with two black men. Well, then the truck passed by. I seen four white men in the cab and three colored men in the back. And I seen somebody sitting down in the truck back there, which was likely Emmett Till. Including one he knew, Levi Too Tight Collins. I saw that truck when he went down the past and I saw that young boy and I saw Too Tight Collins on that car. Reed testified he saw four white men in the cab of the truck and then to hearing a beating at the barn in Drew and seeing J.W. Milam with a gun. Now, later on in the morning, did you see Mr. J.W. Milam out there? Yes, sir. Where did you see him? When I passed by, he came out to the wheel. And was that J.W. Milam, the man who was sitting over there? Yes, sir. Did you see or hear anything as you passed by the barn? I can hear somebody hollering. Mm. And I heard some licks, like somebody was whipping somebody. And I told him what, what, what these people did and what I saw. And I told him the truth because they didn't kill him. He actually said he don't think he could live with it. He don't say he could live knowing that he heard all that noise and heard, all, heard that child hollering and crying and don't say anything. Willie Reed's widow says what he witnessed bothered him his entire life, that he would sometimes have night terrors and that he always stood by his decision to testify. One thing that really touches me is that one of the witnesses, 18-year-old Willie Reed, he, this guy put his life on the line. He came in and it had the courage. Mose Wright famously testified first, standing and pointing out both J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant as the men who took Emmett from his home. I'm going to pause right there for just a second. Um, you can only imagine... What was done to Emmett Till for this man, you know, decades upon decades later to still be having night terrors into his old age about not what he saw, about what he heard. We don't know if he saw anything, but certainly he heard the screams um, coming from, from the barn from Emmett Till. They beat Emmett Till within the inch of his life. They um, castrated him. Uh, they whipped him, wrapped him 
uh, well, actually, they, after they whipped him, they eventually uh, shot him. And that's why his face looks that way, because the bullet exited out the other side and um, wrapped him in barbed wire and tried to weigh down the body with a cotton gin. I believe it was a cotton gin or a wheel, cotton wheel or something, and threw him in the river. And this is probably one of the most um, heinous or graphic um, mob, you know, lynchings of, of that day, aside from when, you know, we were strung up in trees and set on fire, you know. So he knew by testifying he could be killed for this. But he said, a man has to do what a man has to do. And he did it. He did something that no other black man had ever done in Mississippi and lived to tell about. It was a, a real climax. I suppose the first time a black has ever pointed to a white person in Mississippi accusing him of a crime where he could be executed. The defense's case hinged on disputing the identity of the body found in the Tallahatchie River as actually being that of Emmett Till. Mamie Till testified she saw her son's body and she had no doubt. Please state to the court and the jury whether you could identify the body there at the funeral home as that of your son Emmett Till. I positively identified the body in the casket and later on when it was removed and placed on a slab has been that of my son, Emmett Lewis Till. Well, Mamie was terrified to be there in Mississippi. She knew that there was gonna be a, an intensely hostile environment there and she walked into it. What was my concern in the courtroom? More or less a matter of getting in and out alive every day. It was quite heated in that courtroom. Perhaps the star witness for the defense was Carolyn Bryant, although she did not speak Bryant. before the jury. Carolyn Bryant. I was going to say Car Carolyn, Carolyn Bryant. Carolyn uh, Bryant testified that Emmett uh, grabbed her hand when she reached for the money. Mrs. Bryant, will you stand up and put my hand just where he grabbed you? It was like this. In other words, he had his left arm on your back and his right arm on your hip. Yes. Now I'm trying to figure out if he had one hand on her shoulder and one hand on her hip. She was behind the counter. No, he was buying candy or something that he wanted in the store. So I'm trying to figure out how he was able to do all that while she was behind the counter. Because if she was so afraid for her life, I really don't understand what would have made her come from behind that counter for him to do all that. But anyway. And did he say anything to you then at the time he grabbed you there by the cash register? He said, what's the matter, baby? Can't you take it? The trial transcript was lost for almost 50 years. That child the FBI that. found it during its investigation in 2004. It doesn't contain closing arguments, but press reports at the time describe Prosecutor Gerald Chatham raising his arms and shouting, quote, the first words offered in testimony were dripping with the blood of Emmett Till. And defense attorney John Witten declaring, quote, every last Anglo-Saxon one of you men in this jury has the courage to set these men free. Special Prosecutor Robert Smith was convinced of Milam and Bryant's guilt. He knew this, that they had murdered that young man, uh, Emmett Till. They knew it. The judge knew it. And so my father and uh, Gerald Chatham did everything I think you could have done to prosecute them. They didn't pull any punches. In the end, the jury deliberated a little more than an hour. One of them later explaining in press reports, if we hadn't stopped to drink pop, it wouldn't have taken that long. But according to Stephen Whitaker, it really wasn't that clear cut in the jury room. Remember, he interviewed all of the jurors in the early 1960s for his master's thesis. The jury voted nine to three 
to acquit. There were three people on a jury that voted guilty. Three initially voted guilty. Whitaker didn't include that fact in his thesis and had been assumed the jury was unanimous right away, particularly since they bragged about their pot break delay. In fact, this is the first report of the jury having any real doubt. And they voted on the second time, and they voted 11 to 1, and finally the third vote was 12 to 0. Whitaker identified the last holdout as Bishop Matthews of Charleston. And in his thesis, he expanded on the jurors, saying not a single one doubted that Milam and Bryant had killed Emmett Till. You see how they lie? Now, I had never heard that before, that there were, um, that they actually had to go back to the table more than once to get everybody on board with um, a, a not guilty, that they had three who thought were guilty. And that's a lot. For a jury, that's a lot. The three <laughs> told me later on that they felt very bad about what they had done. Mamie Till Bradley didn't wait for the verdict. This is not a verdict we want to hear. She could tell that it was going to be an acquittal. We heard them announce the verdict, not guilty, on our way back to T.R.M. Howard's house. They took me back to Clarksdale, and I was able to get a taxi to take me to Memphis, where we boarded a plane for Chicago. I saw the jury as they came in. The foreman took a little dirty strip of paper out of his pocket and read, we find the defendants not guilty. And I cried to the God of all ages, and ask of him, how long, O oh God, will we have a double standard of justice? A justice for the white man and a justice for the Negro. Less than two months after J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant's acquittal, a LaFleur County grand jury heard the case of kidnapping against Milam and Bryant. Mose Wright and Willie Reed returned to Mississippi to testify. LaFleur County Sheriff George Smith testified as well, but it wasn't enough. The LaFleur County grand jury did not find a true bill in connection with the Emmett Till kidnapping case. No indictment. Mm. Two months later, in January 1956, Milam and Bryant confessed to killing Emmett Till in an article for Look Magazine. They committed the murder and told me they did and told me how they did. William Bradford Huey paid $4,000 for their story. In that account, Milam and Bryant said they acted alone. They made no mention of the barn in Drew. Starting two days after J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant's acquittal for Emmett Till's murder, T.R.M. Howard began urging J. Edgar Hoover to investigate the case. Ultimately, according to David and Linda Beto's book on T.R.M. Howard, it was Juanita Mitchell with the National Council of Negro Women who got federal action. There's a tour of FBI headquarters and she's on the tour and she keeps pestering him. She asked Hoover directly about the additional men Willie Reed had mentioned on the truck with Emmett Till the night he was killed. He writes to uh, one of his assistants in the FBI and says, well, look into this. That led to a slight review including looking into a rumor that Levi Too Tight Collins and another man were hidden away to keep them from testifying. Two of the witnesses were being held in protective custody in Sheriff Strider's jail in Charleston. According to the 2004 FBI report, Prosecutor Robert Smith did search for Collins and the other man at the Charleston jail at the time of the trial. And the report says that search during the trial was basically the scope of the FBI review after the trial. And that ended the FBI involvement at the time, until 2004. Documentaries in 2003 and 2005 mentioned additional people involved that were still alive. Those details and a review of the case by civil rights legal advocate Alvin Sykes led the FBI to open the case once again. And this time the investigation was much more robust. Part of it involved Emmett Till's body being exhumed to prove that the body buried at Burr Oak Cemetery in Alsip, Illinois, was actually Emmett's. The DNA testing proved to the state of Mississippi that there was indeed Emmett buried at Burr Oak. The case also included scores of interviews and an extensive re-examination of the facts. The trial transcript was discovered, 
a gun believed to be used was identified. The 2004 FBI report never confirmed if the two witnesses, including two tight Collins, were hidden away somewhere. But Stephen Whitaker did, through his stepfather, N.Z. Trapp. He confirmed it to me when I was, yeah, very, very many times after that. N.Z. Trout was Sheriff H.C. Strider's deputy in 1955. He said nothing about the hidden witnesses during the trial, but had no problem opening up later. My stepfather knew they were in jail. They were in jail under assumed names, so they could not testify. And they couldn't be forced to testify or allowed to testify. The 2004 FBI report also points to greater involvement by Carolyn Bryant. It shows Carolyn Bryant saying, quote, sometime during the night, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam appeared at the home slash store with Emmett Till the night Emmett was kidnapped so that she could identify him. In the report, her response is redacted. It had gone through all of this, gathered all of the information. The state of Mississippi came, still came out and said there just wasn't enough information to bring an indictment against Callum Bryant. There was a recommendation that she be indicted, a recommendation by the FBI, but of course the grand jury didn't see that there was enough evidence to connect. FBI investigators felt the evidence was strong. The FBI investigated uh, between 2004 and 2006, turned over a massive file uh, to the district attorney in Mississippi, massive meaning like 8,000 pages of documents that that had been put together. In 2007, Joyce Childs, the district attorney for the Mississippi Delta, sought a charge of manslaughter against Carolyn Bryant in the death of Emmett Till. But a LaFleur County grand jury refused to indict. In 2017, the FBI reviewed the case again, this time after an account of a confession by Carolyn Bryant in a book by Timothy Tyson called The Blood of Emmett Till. According to the FBI, Bryant denied making a confession. Despite the fact that Timothy Tyson published what he purported was her confession, in the end, the FBI found no evidence, no credible evidence, as they put in their report, to support what was published in Timothy Tyson's book. The federal investigation into the lynching of Emmett Till was officially over. Today is a day that we'll never forget. Officially... The Emmett Till case has been closed after 66 years. This is a family that's waited 66 years to learn who would answer for Emmett. And now we know nobody. But Emmett Till's story continues to resonate. In 2022, journalists from the Daily Mail found Carolyn Bryant living in Kentucky with her son. They reported she suffers from cancer and is in hospice care. Earlier that same year, someone leaked an unpublished memoir by Carolyn Bryant. Written in 2008, it's called I Am More Than a Wolf Whistle. In it, Bryant stands by her story and declares, quote, I always felt like a victim as well as Emmett. He paid dearly with the loss of his life. I paid dearly with an altered life. Did she tell the truth about what happened at the store? In the manuscript, she not only stands by that story, but she expands on it in ways that, to me, suggest that there is no remorse. You can't don't have any animosity, ill will, or hate. You can't have that. This is the one thing we don't have toward her, you know. The warrant discovered by the filmmaker in the LaFour County Courthouse that same year was never executed in 1955 and could not be executed in 2022. And while there's no statute of limitations for kidnapping under Mississippi law today, there was a two-year statute of limitations at the time the warrant was issued. After more than 200 failed attempts to outlaw lynching, Congress is finally succeeding in taking the long overdue action by passing the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act. Chicago Congressman Bobby Rush sponsored the legislation. I could not have named it and me a, after a more deserving uh, example of what lynching, the horrors of lynching. The Senate has now finally addressed one of the most shameful elements of this nation's past, 
by making lynching a federal crime. That it took so long is a stain, a bitter stain on America. For uh, the president Biden to sign the uh, Immigrant Lynching Act into uh, law uh, means that you know America has made a statement. There is something that has emerged that we can uh, take some solace in. And that is that uh, the name Emmett Till is gonna live on in the context of justice. Every time somebody is brought to uh, justice in the case of a lynching as it's defined in the law, the name Emmett Till will be spoken again. And ultimately Emmett Till's story will be kept alive. His life remembered, a legacy. The verdict was unjust. But because of that verdict, him is still memory and legacy is still alive. Well, you need to get the truth out there. That's why I try to. So. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, so much in a very short documentary. Um, the fact that there was a confession strategically given after uh there was a uh non-guilty verdict a published confession uh from the accusers we don't know if the confession by carolyn uh bryant dunham is credible or not i believe it to be credible my first question is why why did she lie and in my mind i'm thinking that um she may have been coerced. I'm thinking that she may have said something like, oh, the boy looked at me funny. And these men just took the opportunity to show this city, you know, Northern black boy, how they do it in the South. Like they just took it away left. And I'm not making excuses for anyone. Um, it is very possible that she just came home and told this whole fabricated story, but she changed her story so often but um, we actually got to see her karma because even she herself acknowledged. Now, I don't like the fact that she tries to put herself in terms of a victim on the same level of, of, of Emmett Till. She's not a victim. She's not a victim. Uh, you know, whatever she said, and, and even if she was coerced into saying that, her lie, her untruth. This is why I hate lying. I hate lies. I go in on a certain someone a lot because she lies a lot. And those lies, this is what they do. They do things like this, like what we saw happen to Emmett Till. That's what lies do. Um, you know, and she had every opportunity to come forward and say, that's not what happened. This is what happened. But she didn't. And so she, she sees herself as a victim because her life was altered, but at least she had a life. This young boy left this world uh, in torture. He was tortured to death, you know? And Witnesses said that, you know, they heard the screams all night. A 14-year-old, they beat him all night. Well, she lived her entire life. I don't know how old she was when she died. I believe she was in her 80s when she passed. You know, cancer is, um, it's a horrible disease. And her living with this lie all these years is probably you know, why she ended up with cancer. It probably made her sick. Um, it just seemed like there were so many opportunities in this case for things to be done right. Now, I am not going to turn this into a political discussion, but did you see, and I'm going to roll it back uh, just a minute. Did you see uh, what Biden did? Okay. He signed the Emmett Till um, anti-lynching law into, uh, I mean, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act into law. 
I'm not saying that to persuade you one way or another. We are up on an election year, but let me say this. A lot of times we don't hear about what um, our president is doing because of the foolishness and the shenanigans going on in a certain party. You know, the, the, the cases and the shenanigans and the foolishness regarding, you know, Trump. No one person can do everything. But there are small things that have been done that don't always get acknowledged. Now, again, this is not a political discussion. Um, I'm not going to reveal my political party or even have that discussion. But I'm just I'm thinking about some of the things that I've heard. Oh, Biden hasn't done anything for us. Well, it's, it started with the loan forgiveness. And I'm proud to say that I had $170,000 worth of student loan debt forgiven. OK, because of a program started by former President Barack Obama and that program was finished by uh, President Biden and they attempted to stop him at every hand. And still there are millions of people out there due to have their loans discharged. But that program is on hold because, of course, you know, um, the Republican Party doesn't want it. Any opportunity for Black people to uh, get ahead, to move up, if they can keep us in student loan debt, then they can keep our credit bad. And if they keep our credit bad, then we can't qualify for home loans or car loans or get any of those things. So anyway, um, but this this documentary was quite, um, quite eye-opening. Uh, there were so many people that knew the truth and unfortunately... They were able to get away with it. So I just want to say thank you guys so much for being on the live with me. This is a really difficult topic. <laughs> it's not an easy one to hear regardless of what race you are. It's really sad. And the truth of the matter is, um, you know, there are people out there who want us to return to what you just saw. Okay. Want us to return to a segregated world. Want us to return to a world where, you know, one race reigns supreme. All right. And puts their foot on the neck of other people. Um, and so, yeah, but I think these issues are important. I think it's important for us to remember, for us to discuss it and for us to share it. So I went ahead and put the membership link in the chat. If there is anyone that would like to become a member, you can become a wisdom ambassador. The membership is $2.99 and you can join at any time. And Shabi says, when Mammy went to identify Emmett's body, she said she could smell the stench from his body. Absolutely. Well, he was in the river for two days. So here's the thing. The, the intent was for, um, was never for Emmett Till to be found, right? They never intended for him to be found. But it just so happens that in this, this river, uh, for whatever reason, and you can call it, you know, an act of God, his, his body didn't sink. It got snagged. And so it floated back up to the top. Their plan was to make Emmett Till completely disappear. They had no intentions of, you know, there being a mammy who would fight for her child this way, you know, but her courage changed history. It really, really, really did. And you guys saw the church and how many people were gathered in that church to, 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 you know, to, to see him. I don't know if I could have done it. I don't know if I could have done it. Yeah. That, that type of smell is very hard to forget. And the fact of that he was in water makes it even worse. You heard the, um, the photographer said that when they went to the coroner or to the morgue, uh, that the top part of his skull literally fell off his body, you know, and it was the summer and in the summer and in that kind of heat, your body decomposes a lot faster. So, you know, just a really, really sad story. But again, just a reminder of how important it is for us to number one vote, because it was said earlier, definitely make sure that we vote, not just in the primaries, but also in the local election. And that when we hear things like make America great again, well, you know what? America's history is not that great. It's rooted in things like this. It's rooted in racism. It's rooted in um, prejudice. It's rooted in this idea of, of 
you know, being superior to another race. It's not rooted in humanity. It's not rooted in love. It's rooted in taking, stealing, lying, okay, killing. That's what it's rooted in. That's our history. Blood, sweat, and tears on the backs of, of Negro people. And so I'm not really sure what Make America Great Again is, but, you know, America, again, we don't have a great history and it's important that we learn from the mistakes that were made and we understand what is happening because affirmative action has already been taken away. So affirmative action does not exist. I'm going to be, I'm not going to be, I'm working on a story. I don't believe I'm going to do it live. I think it, I'm just going to do a video about a um, historically black college that is now predominantly white. And the story is actually not about the fact that this HBCU is predominantly white. The story is about the the um, suicide of a uh, black staff member at that college. That's what the story is about. But it got my attention because I, I went to a historically black college and I don't understand how um, a historically black college ends up being predominantly white. So it was very interested in that story to see what, what happened there. Uh, but anyway, but guys, thank you so very much for spending this uh, a little over an hour with me. Look out for the additional videos and I will see you on the next one. Bye, y'all.